Thank you, Dr. Feldman, for a great overview. Uh, I'm going to try to make this uh, a little, I'm a rheumatologist, so we'll gear it a little bit more to the joints, and we would love to hear from the audience. So I'm gonna continue this conversation, um, and what I wanted to do is uh, really to highlight uh, psoriatic arthritis in the sense that I think that it's probably um, a more common inflammatory arthritis than many of the rheumatologists um, believe in. If we take a look at this pictorial, which was lent to me by Dr. Chris Richland, looking at how many millions of Americans there are and how many patients um, would get psoriasis um, from the general pop US population, and then how many of those would then get um, psoriatic arthritis. Unfortunately, all the studies are all over the place in terms of incidence, so it's difficult to pinpoint depending on where we are, um, the type of cohorts that we see. But really, I think what falls um, into the dermatology lap is that ma many of these patients see them first and then probably don't see us until they develop uh, much more advanced joint symptoms. So we're hoping to find them much earlier. So it's common for us to believe that there is a long lag period, not always, but in general, um, people get psoriasis up to eight to 10 years um, before getting psoriatic arthritis. And of course, there's exceptions. There's people that present with both immediately, and then in, in some more rare cases, there are people who present with the arthritis first. Um, this is a survey from a while ago, back in 2008, but I think it's interesting to highlight how many um, physicians feel that they take care of psoriasis and psoriatic arthritis. So you have uh, you know, over 11,000 dermatologists and you have over 4,500 rheumatologists that say that they take care of these diseases. So this is just to highlight the point since we're talking about co-management. We also have to remind ourselves who's out there treating these patients who want to see these patients because you want to see people, you want to see physicians that are high volume and who see these types of diseases over and over again. So when you're co-managing, it's, it's interesting because, you know, we always wonder wherever you practice whether or not you have that support and referral system um, in your respective areas in order to get a timely um, referral. And that's one of the reasons I started the Dermatology Rheumatology Clinic in Boston, and I'll talk a little bit more about that this afternoon um, as well. So just to remind us how we even know there's psoriatic arthritis, so Dr. Feldman went over all these things um, in, in his study about, well, what, what would a rheumatologist want us to do? So the best we have now uh, you know, is the CASPER criteria, um, and this is, uh, this is added on to the mole and right criteria that I'll talk about um, this afternoon. But for, for the purpose of this talk, this is really um, used for clinical trials where we're trying to get a homogeneous group of people um, to fall into um, the criteria of psoriatic arthritis. So in this particular criteria, if you look uh, at this chart, I know it's a little busy, but really just pay attention that if you do have uh, inflammatory arthritis, you, you need to collect greater than three points to fall into the bucket of psoriatic arthritis. And what I think is interesting, I'll just highlight, because I know you have this in your syllabus and you can read it in more detail later, but what's interesting is a family history will get you a point, so not even having a current history of psoriasis. And this is really aimed at trying to diagnose psoriatic arthritis a little bit earlier. So this is um, one step more advanced than the mole and right criteria, trying to find patients earlier. The other charge that I had was to have everybody think about comorbidities. So I know we talked a lot about the skin, a lot about the joints, but we all know that when we see a psoriatic arthritis patient, there are many other manifestations that they present with. So yesterday uh, we had talked a little bit about in this blue, uh, the, the cardiovascular risks of psoriasis and psoriatic arthritis. Uh, we also have a lot of um, the additional musculoskeletal symptoms, so it's not just joint but we're also looking at um, uh, other things such as uveitis, um, IBD involvement. And then the other thing is the enthesitis. So this is really important because enthesitis is very difficult. It's difficult even for rheumatologists um, to diagnose. And this is really inflammation um, at the synovial enthesilial complex. So you have different enthesilial pla um, places um, that we all know, plantar fasciitis, Achilles tendonitis are the more common ones. And this really can be debilitating to our patients. 
um, and sometimes can be confused as joint swelling because they're in the areas around the joint, but it's really inflammation of the tendon um, that attaches to the bone. And unfortunately, we don't have as good of metrics of looking at this, so most of the prior studies that you see on TNF aren't measuring enthesitis to the point that we want to. Now we have uh, three different validated measures that we're moving into that more the more current studies in TNF are now highlighting uh, improvement in enthesitis as well as dactylitis. Cardiovascular, I know we went um, with uh, uh, Joel Gelfan, we went over a lot of this, but just to remind us that there are some cross-sectional and prospective studies um, highlighting just on psoriatic arthritis and its cardiovascular comorbidities, all showing that there's an increased risk. Um, and just to remind us that there are no prospective studies that I can tell you, but these are looking um, back um, at, um, at cohorts and following them um, cross-sectionally, um, but not necessarily following them for decades um, forward. The other uh, comorbidities that we need to think about, we talked a little bit about uveitis. Um, I know we're going to have a talk by um, uh, Lisa Grenanetti on um, inflammatory bowel disease um, tomorrow and highlighting that there's a lot of subclinical disease as well that's out there. Um, most of the inflammatory arthritis are also associated with an accelerated form of osteoporosis um, and, you know, screening with DEXAs are important in our patients. And then there's a whole area of, of malignancy that I don't have time to go into in terms of whether it's some of the drugs that we use, whether it's uncontrolled systemic inflammation that's associated with um, some of the risk for solid um, malignancies and other um, tumors, and then the area of skin cancer risk and any of their prior risk factors that put them at risk um, for any of these skin cancers. So this is a uh, pictorial that I use a lot um, in, in talking to my uh, trainees in a, in a Durham room clinic, just to, just to emphasize that it comes in many different flavors. And yes, there are many patients that seem um, obvious if the joints are more predominant, that a rheumatologist might take a lead in that. If the skin is more predominant, we could see the dermatologist taking a lead on that. And then we also know that patients, wear, when they present, they also will go through different phases. So in a couple years, they might get their dactylitis, and they might not have it at the beginning. And their dactylitis might be in their, their toes, and they won't be able to do their job and to work. So, so as we know, these, these boxes can shift within a patient. Uh, but I think it highlights the complexity of why co-management is needed in many times, is because patients may jump from box to box. Patients may feel that their symptoms are um, accelerating in different areas, and I think there is a great need to uh, communicate with your um, other discipline um, in order to really improve the outcomes of, of our patients. These are treatment guidelines. I'm really just uh, here to highlight um, the subgroups. Uh, so as opposed to some of the other inflammatory diseases that I care for, this really has a much more heterogeneity to its disease process, meaning that any of these subgroups can become more predominant at any time. And, it, and as you can see, the treatments differ a little bit, although the biologic um, TNF inhibitors do affect um, all of these but you can see that other treatments, depending on which subgroup is predominant, you might be able to make treatment choices um, based on that. Our landscape is also changing. We're having more and more drugs that are in our toolbox um, that we didn't have. Our uh, you know, newest is a primalast that was out in uh, March of this year for psoriatic arthritis. Uh, we do have... Um, you know, oral DMARDs, as we talked about, methotrexate. Many of this is borrowed from the rheumatoid arthritis literature. So in terms of me being able to show you data specifically on, on, methotrex on uh, methotrexate and psoriatic arthritis are limited, but we do have some. Um, I'm just highlighting sertralizumab because that just uh, had an indication for psoriatic arthritis, arthritis recently. Uh, and then we have IL-1223, ustekinumab, um, that also just recently got approval for psoriatic arthritis. This is uh, from the, uh, the UK. This is a uh, treatment algorithm that I just wanted to uh, bring to your attention. So what this was was an update from the 2005 uh, UK recommendations. And basically at that time, TNF was not um, approved for psoriatic arthritis, so it wasn't in their guideline indications. So they decided to update this uh, just last year. Uh, so Dr. Coates' team 
wanted to look at what is the current evidence of how you should assess joints. Uh, and then most importantly is to really look at these two buckets, the predominant axial disease and the predominant peripheral disease that people with psoriatic arthritis can present with. And based on that subgroup, um, what kind of uh, treatment algorithms um, that, that we look at. So I, I think this is just um, here just to, to highlight the, the subgroup effects of our patients. Um, it's not necessarily the only recipe that we would follow in, in patient care itself. If we look at TNF therapy, um, this is just, I know it's hard to really um, compare uh, studies across, and we really shouldn't do that because each population is very different. But what I do want to bring to your attention is the difference in the skin and the joints. So this first set of bars are what we commonly use in rheumatology, which is the ACR 20, 50, and 70. So these are phase three trials with all the different um, anti-TNFs. And then what do you, how do people think that skin might compare across the board? Better? About the same? Worse? Any guesses? Think the skin improves more, about the same? So just looking at it uh, globally, these are the PASI scores. So you see that the PASI scores are um, a little bit better. And of course, you can't really compare between, but I think it's just interesting to look at uh, skin versus joint as a whole. So moving on to other treatments, used to kinemab is uh, one of our newer for psoriatic arthritis. I know many people in the dermatology world have a lot more experience than um, we do in rheumatology because this is just newly approved um, for us. Um, some of the things that I wanted to point out is that uh, it is uh, weight-based. So if you look, um, so you, um, they do have two different dosing regimens, 45 and 90. There's also the ease of every 12 weeks after the loading dose. And here we just have a little bit of data looking at compared to placebo that it's all statistically significant that the signs and symptoms for PSA do improve. And it, they also have some radiographic data that shows that it slows down some joint uh, damage as well. So basically with all these new tools, we, we ask ourselves, how does this really change my practice? Does this really make it a lot more difficult or a lot easier for us to treat our patients with, with PSA? And that's really where our co-management and where we're talking with our dermatologists will really try to make a difference in improving patient outcomes with these choices. Um, a primalast is um, the, the newer one that I talked about, and we talked about a, a a little earlier that there is, uh, you know, perhaps, you know, the pricing for this is not where we thought it would be at. It's at 22.5, I believe, a year. Um, however, there is uh, some newer um, evidence towards dactylitis and enthesitis that hadn't been in previous trials. So there is some trends to improvement for this oral drug for patients that might have more dactylitis and enthesitis as their um, their issue. The ACR. Um, 20, um, 50, 70, as we alluded to before, probably not as um, efficacious as the TNF, but um, the safety profile does look a little bit um, better. So here you do see um, uh, some at week 16, and then there are some newer data that just came out of our ULAR, our European rheumatology meeting, that showed some sustained benefit out to 52 weeks. Um, so that's some um, new data. And once again, out to 52 weeks, that there weren't any new uh, safety uh, concerns. Um, here we look at the 52-week the data, as we talked about. And, and really, this slide was just to emphasize some of the other um, extra uh, joint sort of skin manifestations that they're looking at, um, looking at uh, the, uh, Macy, the Macy's, which is the enthesitis validated score, and dactylitis. Uh, the other concept that we have now is uh, coming from the Tycopa study. So just as you'll hear this afternoon a little bit more about the treat to target in rheumatoid arthritis, there's also this treat to target looking at psoriatic arthritis, some of the same uh, concept. So here they took patients, um, over 200 patients with newly diagnosed psoriatic arthritis um, who were naive to biologic DMARDs, and they wanted to test two different strategies. One is uh, just kind of standard of care um, every 12 weeks without any treatment protocols, just coming into the doctor, how you're doing, and, and not really having a, a regimented approach. While the other one, the treat to target group, had scales and had treatment changes. Um, throughout um, the study. And what we see here is that people that what we call in the tight control group compared to people in the standard group, it looks like that the treat to target strategy was more effective than just standard of care in terms of improving signs and symptoms. This is of newly diagnosed uh, psoriatic arthritis. 
Um, in the pipeline, I think uh, Dr. Fullman did uh, allude to some of the new uh, drugs um, that are out, uh, looking at um, IL-17 uh, blockade and the different um, phases. Um, these are some of the product lines um, that are in um, certain pipeline um, drugs, just to remind us. Uh, I, I just pulled out one of these slides um, as I uh, just noticed that the PASC-75 here is really at a level that's much um, higher than some of the other um, TNFs, so I just thought I'd um, bring that out. I don't um, have a lot of experience myself in these IL-17 um, uh, biologics, but I think it's interesting in terms of um, their effect on skin. So with all of this uh, studies that I, and treatments that I just mentioned, the question is how do these newer mechanisms of action really change how we treat uh, a patient with psoriatic arthritis? So would you consider these um, drugs first line due to safety? Would you consider these because patients don't want to inject themselves and they want an option orally? Do you ever think about looking at these uh, drugs in terms of combination versus monotherapy? Um, do you add on to methotrexate? Do you switch out methotrexate to one of these drugs? And then it, is there a way that we can uh, redefine or really drill down to see what the subgroup effects are um, with all of the multiple presentations of uh, psoriatic arthritis? And then is there a sort of Tycopa approach where at the beginning for psoriatic arthritis we really should be looking at a more aggressive treatment at the beginning to prevent any of these other sequelae of psoriatic arthritis? So these are all uh, just interesting uh, questions that I don't have all the answers to, uh, but raises the question with all these new treatments. So how do we address really early uh, treatment? Uh, so I think, uh, I think many people have different uh, screening and, and sort of uh, thresholds of when they might refer. I think it's important that, um, that certain co-management strategies can be better developed so that we can share them amongst our interdisciplinary groups. Um, I think this diagnosis is even somewhat challenging for rheumatologists, and I think we need to keep that in mind. So not all patients with psoriasis who present with a joint pain is going to have psoriatic arthritis, right? So osteoarthritis is our most common uh, arthritis um, that we see, affecting over 27 million Americans. So we need to keep that in mind. There's also crystalline diseases, gout, pseudogout, uh, and then there's also non-articular uh, manifestations of things um, more in the chronic pain, such as fibromyalgia, that could also play a role. So I, I do think it's even challenging for a rheumatologist, so it's not so simple that we can really just tell our colleagues, our PCPs, our orthopedists, and our dermatologists, if your joint looks like that, it's psoriatic arthritis, you should start this, or you should refer to us immediately. So I think there's some complexities that are there. So we also did a study trying to better understand uh, where we should go with screening. So I'm going to present some data. Um, when I started the first uh, dermatology rheumatology clinic, I worked with Dr. Qureshi um, in Boston, and we actually trained together as a uh, we trained together as uh, residents and. The reason that we started a derm room clinic wasn't so much to be innovative as it was just to help patient care. So what would happen is I would call derm and they would offer me an appointment like in 2015. And he would call rheumatology and they would offer an appointment like nine months down the road. And so it just, it, so what happened was we became referring to each other because it just got easier and we got our patients in sooner. And then within uh, six to nine months, we developed the first sort of dermatology, rheumatology clinic when we graduated from our respective residency programs and um, as staff. And so what we decided to do is really take a look at our first 100 patients that came in the door with musculoskeletal pain and psoriasis. Now, remember, at this time, I was fresh out of residency of rheumatology uh, fellowship and him out of dermatology resident. And we were cheerleading for ourselves, like, come on, send us patients. We really want to make this um, cross-disciplinary clinic work. And what happened uh, was that we had really well-meaning um, colleagues of ours that was um, sending patients with psoriasis and musculoskeletal pain. And they all kind of thought in the back of minds, oh, this is definitely psoriatic arthritis, but we're going to give it to this cross-disciplinary clinic. So this is how the pie chart looked in the 100 patients that came through. And this started out as one of my fellows' projects until I graduated. And so what was interesting is that 
what I mentioned that a story is that these are my colleagues that are sending that are in academic practices who have a lot of experience in um, psoriasis and psoriatic arthritis. And of the people that came by, you see that only 41% actually um, had psoriatic arthritis at the end of the day. So it just highlights all the different um, aches and pains that people can have and what actually um, happens um, in the real world. So this was all validated, again, by a separate um, dermatologist and a separate rheumatologist with x-rays and skin exams, um, looking to, to see what the, and, and following some CASPER criteria, which ones actually had psoriatic arthritis based on the referral. So based on that, a couple years later, we developed something called the PACE questionnaire. And this is uh, something that uh, we felt um, could help highlight screening procedures to make it easier for dermatologists. So these are not necessarily validated in primary care offices, but our, our sole purpose was to really help the dermatologist. So we know everybody has high demands on their time, so we decided to really sort of take the physician out of the picture, and we concentrated on the patient, because we figured what the patient could tell us would be helpful. So you have seven um, questions based on their symptoms and eight questions um, based on their function. And if you scored over, uh, higher than, uh, this takes about maybe a couple minutes to do in the, um, in the waiting room or while they're waiting to get changed to see your, or after your MA sees them, uh, we would distribute this. It would take a couple minutes. We would score, um, they would be scored by uh, your, uh, your healthcare team or the physician, whoever had time. If you scored um, above, you know, a 37, then um, it would uh, help the dermatologist um, tell you that they would need a referral to rheumatology to have a better um, uh, uh, evaluation. So we did not think that um, it would be reasonable in a typical derm appointment for a dermatologist to do a joint exam, order x-rays, um, do um, you know, different articular exams, gait exam, as, as Dr. Feldman had, had mentioned. We thought that maybe this would be an easier way. So we now have, uh, uh, we have some sensitivity and specificities um, um, in larger and larger groups as we're um, collaborating with other people across uh, the country as well as across uh, the world, um, looking at pretty good sensitivity and specificity. Um, it is now translated into 15 different languages um, across the world, the PACE um, questionnaire. So, so I think in conclusion, I just wanted to um, emphasize uh, some of the optimization that could occur in more of the complex cases. I think there are some simple cases that might not require um, uh, you know, constant communication between Durham and room, but there are certainly patients that are a lot more complex that would benefit from this. Um, I think patients, um, what I've learned from the dermatology, rheumatology clinic, is that patients really appreciate that exchange and that um, sort of immediate feedback. So we actually see patients in the room together, a dermatologist and a rheumatologist. So the patient does have to pay two copays when they come into um, our derm room uh, clinic, because it's as if two visits with two different um, sets of medical records. Um, but they do get um, to see both the dermatologist and the rheumatologist at the same time. It really fosters different areas of, of collaboration um, between uh, dermatology and rheumatologists hearing different thoughts about how we screen for other things, whether it be uh, uh, liver biopsies and methotrexate, malignancy screening, vaccinations, and it could go on and on. Um, and really creating that environment um, where it can lead to a better understanding of the complex diseases. Um, so I know in many places, um, when I give this talk, they say, well, you know, Elena, we, we don't really have a, you know, a dermatologist or rheumatologist where we could get together to see patients. Um, and so what I say to that is that, yes, you might not have a physical space where you can see patients together, but you can certainly develop a relationship with one or two uh, you know, rheumatologist or dermatologist in your area. And I think what's important is to really just kind of like to pick up the phone and talk to your fellow colleague. I know that sounds really simple, but I think when you pick up only when you're desperate because there's a hot swollen joint or only desperate when there's, you know, 90% covered skin area and you say, I need to see this patient in now, is probably not the best way to um, be the first time to interact with your colleagues, right? So the, the best time is really when you have some time to think and that you can pick up the phone and talk to them. And over time, I think many of these co-management issues are going to be the same whether or not you have this great physical space to see with each other or whether you're just across town and you develop a relationship over the phone. <laughs>